Well, look at that. We're live. It is live and well. I'm Chris Brogan. That is Sam Collagion from Dogfish Head. We were also expecting some gang from other music who uh, may or may not still show up for this music and beer pairing contest. That'll be uh, Josh, Chris, Amanda, and da Daniel. Uh, but we were having a little bit of possible technical difficulty. So on the odd shot that they don't make it here, Sam and I feel even vaguely capable because uh, we're men thrown into a situation where we don't really know what we should do, which means, of course, we know how to figure it out. Um, we did this last year as well, and uh, with the sort of trinity of Other Music, which is a New York-based uh, music company, they uh, live, I forget, they're like directly across the street from an old uh, tower or something, and they do lots of really cool, interesting, alternative type music to what you normally were going to hear, so they've given us five CDs, which are their picks for interesting things to pair with uh, drinks. Sam and I, of course, had a, a kind of different take on it than they would. Uh, so you get our not uh, high informed. fidelity version. <laughs> our Sam. other less informed opinion. We both love music, but we certainly know to stick to our day jobs compared to the guys from other music. You got that right. So Sam, first off, uh, what are you uh, what are you sipping over there right now? I am enjoying uh, um, a 61, which is a beer we uh, released uh, for the first time in t 2013. Uh, and we worked with our pal, the musician Will Oldham, uh, who records as Bonnie Prince Billy, and he did two original songs that we did a small vinyl pressing, uh, one called 61, named after the band, and one was an old uh, body sort of standard uh, called 60 Minute Man. Uh, and he put out an album uh, with those two songs on it with us, and we went and did an event with him in his home, home city of Kentucky. But it's basically a big hoppy IPA. You can see how red it is. And that's because about 25% of the fermentable sugars come from Syrah grapes. Yeah, that's the craziest part to me. So the idea of mixing an IPA with Syrah grapes is pretty off the beaten path. And, and, and this is coming from you, who's done all kinds of crazy things like go to Egypt to find ancient things to right. put in beverages. So what made you think, you know what I think would go great with an IPA, which is horrendously hoppy and bitter? Right. I think some grapes. What made you think that? Um, I would say this, it was just kind of uh, a spontaneous thing where my buddies and I would go to a restaurant that happened to have 60-minute IPA, but it didn't have a, a big, broad uh, beer menu, but it had awesome, awesome wine. Uh -huh. And so we would each order a 60-minute, and then we would order one glass of really good Syrah Pinot Noir, and we'd take a big slug of our 60-minute and pour a little of the, the beer in the tops of ours. It was kind of like one of those, you got your peanut butter my chocolate you know, revelations that worked, and I said, "Hey, we got to figure out how to bottle this." And it took us a year to dial in the the recipe, but we're we're glad we did. Yeah, there's a there's an interesting complexity to it because when you drink an IPA, you're expecting that kind of punch in the belly hops. I mean, you're 60 minutes that for sure, but your 90 is also, you know, and then the 120. I mean, we just go crazy, but. Mm -hmm. You know, what's really neat about it is it does have that sort of, uh, you know, beautiful kind of rich bottom underneath it, I guess, in my pathetic language for this. Mm. You know what it makes me think of, though? I, you know, I love things like Raison Dead as well. So suddenly you have sort of like a small stable of uh, whiny beers. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. And we, uh, we've been playing around with beer-wine hybrids since Raison Detra in the, in the mid-'90s and Midas Touch and uh, yeah. Noble Noble Rots, another one that we do, Red and White with Pinot Noir grapes. So we kind of have a, a little niche going for beer wine hybrids that we really really are, are proud to have been playing playing around with uh, for so long. What else you been drinking besides Dog for Shed this year? What other beers, oh, spirits, wines have been have have you been going back to this year? You know, uh, my friend Steve Sanderson, who's a local guy who came out of the investment banking world but was a big-time beer fan for decades, and he was, you know, one of those kids who, when he started out making you his homebrew and bringing it around for the holidays, you just smiled politely and were like, okay, thank you, and you'd throw it when he wasn't looking. Uh, but then, you know, a year or two later, he was better. A year or two later, he convinces his wife he's going to quit investment banking and do that. And now uh, he's running this Riverwalk Brewing Company, and he's got a pretty real good setup going. Where you know he's got he's got the good gear, you know, commercial size stuff, and he's just putting more and more barrels down. So he's got a nice IPA. I'm trying to remember. He's got a um, he's got another couple of other uh, good ones like that. And what and, town is that in Riverwalk? 
Well, so it started in Amesbury, Massachusetts, and they bumped him out of town for a couple of reasons that had nothing to do with him. It was everything to do with, uh, you know, I don't know if we want a brewery in our town. And so he's next door in Newburyport, Massachusetts, which is a a touristy town. He's got a beer, for instance, called uh, Nomad, which is, uh, you know, not so hoppy. Uncle Bob's Bitter, and of course they've got an IPA. So he's gone from his, like, 50 different recipes down to just a few. Right, right. Nice. Um, By the way, the folks from Other just uh, made a ping to Mariah, so she might be able to give him a ring. She gave a cell phone number. Uh, While we're at this, though, we're supposed to pair this with some music. So given that the other folks aren't here, Uh if I were going to pair 61... Uh, you know, you like you said, you you made this for this uh, great musical uh, uh, thing going on. But from the five discs that we were given, mm-hmm. what what one could line up to that? Would you say? Um, you know, of the ones that we got, you know, I'd probably for me, I get a lot of um, sort of a, a collision of different worlds, different cultures. I guess wine culture and beer culture in this. I would probably go with the, and I'll pronounce his name wrong, but this uh, the the uh, who is William Onyebor? Uh, That's about as good as I could have said it. <laughs> you know, Onyebor, I'm guessing. Uh, a, it's got a rad sort of reddish color uh, label uh, that goes really, really well with the beer. But it's uh, world music. It's published by its on Luca Bop uh, label, which is David Burns World Music label. And uh, the songs are epic. They're like eight and ten minute. Uh, really upbeat and just all over the place. Uh, how would you describe the music when you listen to it? Yeah, you know, so it's it's an African style music. He's out of Nigeria. It's got this very kind of neat beat and bounce to it going on. One of the things that I liked about it as well, though, is uh, it reminded me. They would hate me. I'm so glad they're not on the call right now. <laughs> uh, it reminds me sort of uh, like Entertainment Weekly called the number one song of the year, Daft Punk's "Get Lucky." And yep. it is uh, the first 2,000 times you hear it, it's pretty catchy. And then after that, you just want to you know, slam the door on your own head. <laughs> I think this album has that sort of a feel to it. It's like you said, all the songs, I'm looking at the back, this, this, the shortest song is six and a half minutes long. Yep. And each time I was listening to it, I had this feeling of it being more like a soundtrack kind of an album. Like you had to be in the going somewhere mode. And so... The other way it would work really nice, though, is that, you know, you were hanging out with a bunch of people, you were working on something, maybe you were, I don't know, sanding a deck or something, and yeah. it's, it's, it, that would be too pedestrian a task to put the 61 to, to use, but I think it would be a delicious thing as the night got on a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking it would also be good, great music for, like, a dinner party, like background music, not too loud, but it's festive and mm-hmm. up, upbeat music, so I, I, uh, I dug it. I really did like it. And the dude's such a sharp dresser. Did you see that? Yeah. <laughs> JR. Oh, so you got the vinyl. He, he makes strong. me think of uh, JR from Dallas uh, mixed with I, Gary Coleman. Um, there is. That is a little mix in there. I see what you mean. So he's a. Uh, <laughs> and on the back, actually, he looks like an actor who I can't think of the name of who was in uh, probably most famously Black Hawk Down. Um, but what's really oh, interesting, yeah, yeah. the other thing I wanted to say about this album, by the way, again, because the other folks aren't here from other music, uh, yeah. little is known about William Anyabor, and that's the way he likes it. Though we speak to him frequently and visit him, his complete unwillingness to speak about the past has left us on a long search for information. At the same time, the few bits of conflicting information we've gleaned have told us that all of the information that's out there isn't exactly a suspect. It's suspect. So... I think it's an interesting way to, to cast this musician, and I wouldn't say anything in your beverage is suspect, but it's the kind of thing that if you explain to a friend, you know, I think a nice IPA with wine poured in it would be delicious. Right, it might be a difficult jumping off point. I, and I love how mysterious he is. You know, there was that great, uh, um, there was a great documentary, I don't know if I'm going to remember uh, the name about a musician that came out last year about this guy who kind of, disappeared and everybody thought he was dead. He was from America, like Chicago somewhere, and they found him, uh, I forget, in Chicago, but he, his albums became huge. I think it was in South America. Um, do you know that the documentary I'm talking about? I, I'm trying desperately to remember the title, but I, I'm going to have to you know, punch Google in the mouth and see what I can get out of it. Uh, if I think of it, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll remember it. I'll, let me see if I can remember it. A couple more sips of beer might help with that. 
Yeah, I think that could happen. Uh, Born in Chicago, is that the one? You... No, no. No, that's no. a blues musician one. That's... Yeah, it was a documentary about this dude, and I'm, I'm never going to... I'll remember it in a moment later, I think. Muscle Shoals. In the second beer. No, not no. Muscle Shoals. It was this guy. But the difference is that he was he got rediscovered in this process, and now he's out touring again, and he's out, you know... Making a, a big career of it and playing on these big stages oh, around the world. Oh my gosh! It's very different from this this guy who they've discovered rediscovered him. He's like, leave me the fuck alone. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, and, and you know, it's a really interesting method. But I mean, who knows? Again, because the poor other music people aren't here to to cringe when Me I does. say this. Beyonce just put out her new album, and evidently the big buzz was that she did nothing to warn people. She didn't give the typical drops ahead of time. She didn't give everyone a track thing. She just turned it on, and it was became the number one selling album in iTunes. I doubt anyone will be able to do that again. Uh, and evidently they say it's a pretty decent album. What do I know? I did. I, re I read about that, and I think what she did do though was she released a, a a video for every single song on the album the moment that she she released it. So you know, with someone with her you know sort of connections and capabilities and financing to to do video for every song, it's probably no one else like you said that could release it that way and get it done and become the number one record in the country. But uh, it's not like she's just uh, somewhere in Northampton, Mass, on, in a grunge band, <laughs> unsigned and doing it. She has she has some power behind her. Yeah. Well, you know, she she and her husband both put out albums. They in very different ways. Uh, Jay Z sold five million copies before the album dropped uh, via Samsung, so it would get to the Galaxy people first. That were using. Yeah. Like, I remember so. that was pretty pretty controversial. Do you, as a, a sort of business and marketing? oriented uh, guy, do you enjoy watching, like, for me this year, the, the lead up to the Arcade Fire album release, and you kind of watched how they were doing little tiny uh, moments of, of marketing, but still trying to be sort of indie and, and irreverent in the way that they, they kind of led up to the release date and had Pitchfork fawning over, over what was going to be happening next and stuff. I think that's pretty interesting to watch, the way the different bands come to market as a brewer and a guy who releases products, you know, a company. So I feel like I learn as much from watching the music world as I do from watching the beverage world. Right. I mean, th th there's a very interesting connection there too, Sam, because I think that the way that you put out as much product as you do, I mean, you're, you're the least slouchy beverage producer in the universe. It, it would be... It's pretty unfair to do it the way you do it because you know the majority of beverage people are like, I have a new beer for eight years, and <laughs> if some the, some people within my own within our own organization would like to see that that rate slow down, and and you do you kind of get to a limited bandwidth moment, but we we love to experiment. We just gotta it gets it gets a little more difficult as the company gets bigger because it's uh you know like they say the bigger ship to turn type of stuff. Right. It, it makes it it makes it fun, and so you get your big. You get your big projects like uh, uh, the book that you're working on, for instance, and that's amazingly rewarding, but probably instant gratification more would come from blogging and, and working on your magazine and things that have quicker release dates, I imagine. Sure, yeah. And, and, and you know, it's funny because not unlike music, uh, books are in this spot where no one knows how to market them anymore. And, uh, you know, my friend Gary Vaynerchuk just released his new one, Jab, 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 Right Hook. His yeah. version is just beat people until they buy it. Uh, he He's just a fierce marketer. And uh, my version is I'm, I'm still trying to work on some, you know, not gimmicky ideas, but ideas that will put some leverage behind it. And so, similar to yourself in, in, in tying a beer release or a, a product release of yours to music or something like that, you're, you're really trying to build a culture of community around the product, and, and you have a culture. You know, it's an interesting thing how that works, and I think that there's some opportunity. You know, totally apropos of nothing, I was listening to NPR, uh, rolling through town, and they were talking about, of all things, um, all the fish in the ocean and all the census counting they've been doing, and we're running out of the fish that we tend to eat as uh, nature, you know, just as, as the things that we tend to like to eat, like Chilean sea bass and cod and haddock and all those fish names you know, yeah. we're running out of them. And so randomly, uh, the guy is like, well, so what are we going to eat? Are there any fish that are in abundance? And dogfish. Uh, oh, yeah. 
So it happens we that you, you, know, you may well be the known <laughs> brand of very fascinating food stuff for uh, people all over. So I, in in uh, in England, the dogfish is very common, from what I understand. In fish and chips, is what I've been told. Ah, uh, okay. Here, yeah. in, here in in New, here in the East Coast, it's kind of looked upon as a pain in the ass fish that gets in the line of the fishermen and the lobstermen. So right. If I were a strong marketing person, I probably never would have uh, named my uh, company after something that people associate with disappointment and frustration and anger. Well, 50 years ago, that was lobster, by the way. So yeah, um, in Maine, where I'm from originally, there's actually still law. It's written into law that prisoners can only be served lobster a, a maximum of three times a week because it used to be that they'd be fed lobster like every lobster day. Lobster again! Yeah, exactly. Ah, riot. We're going to riot. <laughs> hey, let's go on to another beer. Um, yep. I am sipping this Dogfish Head Piercing Pills, which is a Czech-style pilsner brewed with some pear juice, a little bit of pear tea just in case, and saze or saz hops. Mm -hmm. Saz hops, yep. Saz hops. Now, I was saying ahead of time that, you know, saying that I love pilsners is like, you know, asking your friend's band to play Smoke on the Water. Um, a, a pretty pretty uh, prolific in terms of what's out there, right? And sort of pedestrian, and you know, if you're going to buy a mainstream beer, 80% of the time you're getting a Pilsner or a, a very soft lager. It's what sort of the American palate is used to. But that doesn't mean you can't make it sort of interesting. What made you take this on? What made you say, you know what, we need another one? Yeah. Uh, well, really, we were looking to switch up our winter seasonal. We've been doing the chicory stout, and we love that beer, and we'll still do it on draft locally. But it's been our go-to winter beer for almost our whole 19 years in existence, and uh, we thought it'd be fun to do something very different. And pilsners are traditionally drunk in the hot summertime weather, right? Uh, and they're usually just made with water, yeast, hops, and barley. Um, but you know, I'd, I'd been eating. I was eating a pear and, and drinking a hoppy uh, pilsner, and uh, from Victory, I really love uh, uh, the the Pilsner that they make, and I was having a pair with that one day, and I was like, man, these go really well together, and that got us down the road of experimenting. And then uh, we had different brewers in our in our company do different small trial batches of it, mm -hmm. and one of the brewers, Clay, and his team had the idea of not just add the pear uh, fruit and the pear juice, but to add a pear tea late in the process, because in the brewing process, the later you add an ingredient. In the process, the more it contributes aroma, and the earlier you add an ingredient in the process, the more it uh, contributes taste. So this beer has pear juice early for the taste and pear tea post-fermentation for aroma. And I guess I can smell pear. Um, speaking of pear, how do we pear it? Good, I, good segue. You're a pro. I had to guess I would, I would go with my expert, you know, express rising, but I don't know. What's your thought? What, I, like, your... I like that one, too, and... Um, you know, part of me was thinking the the I love the Steve Gunn album, but and I, you know that one to me it reminded me more of uh, like uh, Nick Drake or, or more even maybe a little Van Morrison. For me, those that kind of music's more like summer, warm weather oriented. Yeah. Uh, and the 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 more instrumental album, this uh, uh, Express Rising album, I think you're right. It would be the better pair for it. What do you think? How would you describe this music? Boy, you know. Again, I'm so glad that people from other when they watch this thing later and they're gonna just they're gonna just bite their mouths off or something. Um, I thought of this as kind of that it mixed it reminded me of two things. It reminded me of if you remember in the 1980s, like every third movie, especially action movies, were all like scored by Tangerine Dream. Yep. Uh, and you know, the ninja movies, all of that. And it was essentially it seemed to me like one guy with one synthesizer. And this has sort of a taste back to that. Yeah. It also uh, made me think of some of those holiday albums like those Mannheim Steamroller typey things where they're really trying to push in an emotion and you're supposed to leave this feeling like something. So like Horse Opera is one of the songs that made me think that. And so this, I put this in sort of a snowy, you know, like that beautiful background you have there. Like mm -hmm. snow should be falling and we should, you know, be cuddled up under some Snuggies uh, listening to this. Yep, yep. And we're Mariah's trying to get the guys uh, from other music piped in uh, here oh, cool. too. But uh, no, I agree that it has kind of both a sort of a nostalgic, backwards-looking feel, but still kind of, you know, futuristic as well. I listen to a lot of uh, instrumental music, and it reminded me of uh, 
bands like uh, Explosions in the Sky and oh, yeah. uh, Boards of Canada. Um, so this this one was right up my alley. It's exact. It's wonderful for me to find you know learn about something that that I didn't even know existed and be like, wow, okay, this is something that I know I'm going to be returning to and listening to pretty often. Um, oh, they're saying there's questions here tonight. Oh, so right. great. Uh, are you seeing those there too? I don't think I do. Uh, okay. I think that's just for you, the boss. So I'm the boss. So what do I do here, Mariah? It says Let's dude, see. I'm here. Q and A. This features disabled. What do you I got? Think. Oh, good. Okay. So uh, basically, let's see. Beyonce, really? Why the hell? Okay, they're saying, <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're trashing me for mentioning it. <laughs> <laughs> they're fellow beer folk. They wanted. All right, so you, you got to go deeper. If they're, if let's say you were drinking a double IPA, something super hoppy and, and ambitious, what what music would you pair that with? They're saying Bud Light Cranberita is what they would pair Beyonce with. What would you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give him that. What would you What would you pair? Super Hoppy Double IPA. For, for All right, me? it's a Boston area band uh, that I liked a lot more when my friend was playing cello for them. Uh, it, they're called the Ballroom Thieves. You can go look at it. They got a new album out on uh, something else. It's a It's a three part type of group. One guy plays guitar. One plays, I'd say, percussion. To be polite, it's more like a flipped over bongo, and he's really good at that. Uh -huh. and my friend My friend Rachel was their cello player. Now there's a new girl. I can't remember which her name is, but but very fun, very, uh, you'd expect them to, uh, they could at the same time open for the Dropkick Murphys, or they could open for uh, um, uh, Rabbit Band, Frightened Rabbit. Oh, are they, they're also from New England? They're uh, Boston area, so, yep. Nice. Now, let's see, it says, hey, it's Josh from Other, we need an invite. Uh, oh, so click so on his little namey, so they, there's Amanda. I'd say percussion to be polite is more like a flipped over bongo, and he's really good at that. My friend, my friend Rachel was their cello player, and now there's a new girl. I can't remember what she, her name is, but very fun, very... Uh, they're so delayed that they're getting it after the fact. Uh, they could at the same time open for the Dropkick Murphys, or they could open for uh, um, uh, Rabbit Band, Frightened Rabbit. Oh, are they, they're also from New England? They're uh, Boston area, so, yep. Yeah. Nice. Now let's see. It says, hey, it's Josh from Other. We need an invite. I think we're here. Do you guys uh, Oh, so click so on this little namey. So think, there's Amanda. It's a tweet card. Uh, right. Hi, guys. I'd say percussion to be polite is more like a flipped over bongo, and he's really good at that. Uh, how, for, how do we get rid of the echo? Okay. Is, very fun, very... Uh, they're so delayed that they're getting it after the fact. Uh, they could at the same time open for the Dropkick Murphys, or they could open for... Uh, 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 what was this one? Rabbit Band. Frightened Rabbit? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, were they, they're also from New England? Oh, I think they fixed it. Right. Whoa. Nice. Yeah. nice. <laughs> All right, we made it. And you guys are actually in the store, I can see. Yeah, we're in the store. We're sitting in front of records. All right, you kick everybody out to join us. Hey guys, how are you? Uh, we're we're so so. We had a, we have been trying to hook up with you guys, but uh, we've right. been listening to you, and you guys had a lot of smart things to say about these records. So, so oh, we were, we've been terrified only... the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> we felt all alone in an iceberg. We're glad you guys reeled us back in. You know what, maybe we should do, uh, as long as the delay is not too, too bad, maybe we should let you go back and politely make us smarter about who is William Anyabor and Express Rising, even just a couple of lines each about them, because, you know, we, we were so, you know, we did our pedestrian best, but what are your thoughts on that? Maybe you should introduce yourselves as well. Um, hey, I'm Josh. Um, we, we all, we're all from other music here. Chris and I are the co-owners. Chris is on the other end there. Yes. And, uh, and this is Amanda and Daniel, and we've all been working here for a long time, and uh, it's great to be with you guys. We're glad you're here. We can't quite see Josh. I don't know if we can either scoot you guys in a little closer or, or move that back a little, but we see Chris. three out of four of you. Closer makes it worse. Yeah. Well, you guys scoot in a little bit. Nice. You guys are all buddies. I know, but we can't hear it all. Okay, I see you now. Cool. Yeah.
Yeah, the one downside I think of having four people is is only that you know Sam, you and I have the earphones and they're like they've turned the sound down so that it doesn't echo loop and uh, they'll probably be you know feeling doomed with answering questions or whatever. But why don't we let you guys do? We've only gotten through two of the albums, so your your timing's pretty good. Do you want to co comment on the first two albums? Do you want to talk about the writing maybe? Sure. Uh, what do I know about specializing? Well, one thing. You know how last year we gave you guys the personal space compilation as yep. one of the best? He, he was one of the people involved in compiling that CD. Um, he's done a lot of work. He's Chicago-based. Um, done a lot of work for Numero through the years. Uh, he released a record under Express Rising a couple of years ago that we did really well with. That was more of a kind of abstract, abstract beat-oriented instrumental record. And then this one, now he's using more live instruments. Um, it has a little bit more of a post-rock kind of feel, leaving the beats a little bit more behind and now getting more into melody and live instruments. We really love, I, I, we both really like that one. Uh, you know, I, th I, I thought it was very uh, Boards of Canada-esque and... Uh, uh, even some explosions in the sky type type uh, references for me, but it's one I would definitely listen to. I'd say yeah. it's top, in my top two of your top five. How about you, Chris? Oh yeah, same thing. I really enjoyed that one a lot. And uh, the other one that we we messed with, and you have to just give us a sentence or two about, is the Who Is William Anyabor. I what I said about it was that uh, it made it sound to me a little bit like. Uh, a, you know, Quentin Tarantino waiting to stuff this into a soundtrack somewhere. So I'm just kind of curious what you're thinking about it. I mean, you know, he's, it's funny. I mean, it's been an amazing story just seeing this record come out this year because he's, um, apparently he's still a taxi driver um, kind of doing his own thing and has kind of given up music or wouldn't have anything to do with promoting it. Um, the people at the Walk of Off worked really hard over the past several years trying to get this compilation out. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's just um, just so, I mean, anytime you put that on, it lights up a room. He's um, he's so impassioned. It's you know definitely has a lot of politics in it, but and and personal politics. But it's just to me, it just seems so. Um, it, he's just such an individual. You can just hear his passion with everything that he does. Um, you know, and and it's uh, just just really soulful, really loose. Um, so much, I mean, the keyboard's amazing, but his his voice is what moves me every time. He's just such an impassioned singer. And then the fact that he won't, you know, that he's just walked away from it all, you know. There's people all over the world talking about that record. It was, you know, in Time Magazine, I think it was one of their albums of the year. It's like really crossing all boundaries, but, and he's just driving his taxi, you know, sort of doesn't even want to talk about it anymore. Can you guys, do you guys remember, we were talking earlier about, there was a documentary that came out last year about a musician who I think was an American guy, and his album became super popular in another country, and they did a whole documentary about him, and he went back out on the road. You Rodriguez. Yes. His name is Rodriguez. Searching for searching Sugar for, Man. Yeah, Searching for searching Sugar Man. Searching for Sugar Man. It's almost the opposite story of this, where he was discovered, and then he went right back into his career, unlike this guy. Yeah, Rodriguez is now playing at uh, arenas, and you know, really sort of has embraced it, and, and Anya Bor, you know, is... Uh, Still doing his thing. He's, I think he's happy leaving it. He put everything into it back then, and he's, I think he's ready to leave it like it was. You know? Yeah. Well, cool. So we're going to move into the third one, but uh, one of the th last things I wanted to say about the William Onyabor is they said that, for instance, um, Entertainment Weekly called Daft Punk's Get Lucky their number one pick of song of the year, and I said for anyone who wants a palate cleanser, this is... Uh, you know, a nicer version of that to get yourself into that's got that digital backbone but a lot more uh, optional stuff. Now, it, so pretending we picked those as, you know, the first couple of ones that we really liked, you've got three more to tell us that you want to talk about next. It could be Steve Gunn, it could be, I don't know how to pronounce it, Seada Bonaire, and it could be King mm -hmm. Cruel. And uh, I, I'll tell you ahead of time that, you know, I, I already sort of said that this one, you know, because it harkens back to 80s synth pop, uh, you know, was it my absolute favorite? So I'd love to hear the story there. And then King Cruel was just uh, 
there was a little work to getting into that one, I think. It, it was not uh, accessible, I guess, is my sort of take. Which one do you want to talk about first, and then I guess we'll try to pair that with some delicious beverage. Oh, we didn't talk. Did you guys already talk about pairing the Anyabor and the Express Rising with beers? We did a little bit, but you guys didn't, so go right ahead. But what, what did you guys say? Uh, Express Rising I put together with uh, Piercing Pills because of the sort of, uh, this is Sam's winter choice now that's uh, temporarily replacing one of their stouts except for locally and uh, I thought that the Express Rising had a certain kind of wintry nice flow that you could sort of uh, tuck in under a Snuggie and deliciously enjoy this together but love to hear your take. And then for, for William Onyebor's album we both, uh, we both picked uh, the 61 uh, kind of, it's it seemed to be, you know, uh, such a, a, a hybrid of sounds and instruments, and a very sort of you know global hybrid type of of music, and uh, you know, so the hybrid of the IPA and the Syrah grape must in the '61, plus the color of that beer, it's so bright red, and the album cover itself is such a vivid red that they kind of looked, they look really like they belong together as well. What do you think, Amanda? I mean, we, I mean, I have to say, we were kind of, we saw the the India Pale Ale actually with the Express Rising. Uh-huh. It's a nice album to take in, and this is such a luxurious beer. It is kind of relaxing to, like, drink it, and it's such an intricate flavor to it. And then, and I, yeah, and kind of the opposite, and then the um, the Pilsner with the Omnivore. But anyway, we should go on to the other ones. Okay, and this is what this is why you have so many albums behind you, and why we have so many beers to choose from, right? Everybody's, everybody's palate is different. Mhm. Mm um, <laughs> All right, where do you guys want to go for the third album? Chris, would you want to talk a little bit about this? I'm going to move this just over to show yep. Chris a little bit, yep. and we're going to talk about the King Cool record. Mhm. The King Cool record. It's fine. It's um. I know Chris was saying it was a little, kind of a little inaccessible at first, um, and he had a, you know, he had an ET out last year, um, that kind of came out. And for me, it kind of came out of nowhere. I know he had done some stuff previously under different names, but I thought the EP was so striking last year, and this album kind of fleshes it out even more. Um, I mean, it's, I find it, it's obviously very it's very British, you know, and. Um, I could see where it could be maybe a little inaccessible, but once you get into it, it really hooks me. I really, I, I really am fascinated by it. Well, he might be the most popular artist. Huh? I mean, in terms of like these people, he, he can he's done very well with that. Sell out yeah. huge venues yeah. around you know around the world. Definitely in England, but in, in New York, you think he played what was his last Web, Webster Hall yeah. um, a couple weeks ago, and the guy's like you know he's like 19 years old at this point. He's still just like 19 years old, and he's got this. Just, it's all, for me, it's all about the delivery. It's like his, his, uh, it's that accent, that delivery, that casualness, you know, that too cool. It's just like something about it I find very, just very inviting and something kind of cool about it. When I was drinking and listening to it, it reminded me you guys chose an album last year from Mac DeMarco, and uh, or actually I think you chose two. I, right. I, I thought it was like uh, kind of Bill, uh, Billy Bragg meets Mac DeMarco. I mean, the accent was, was English, but kind of equally heartfelt and but quirky. Uh, you know, a huge, a huge, very, uh, very unique sound. So I agree with Chris that it takes a little while to get into it, but it did that. Mac DeMarco was like that for me last year. I listen to both those albums all the time now. Yeah, you know. I was just going to say one of the other things that I found about it when I, you know, went through it a second time or a third time or whatever, you know, songs like Easy Easy, for instance, I found that uh, I, I kept, you know, there's this whole new wave of music that seems to be really pulling from the 70s and, and just not even hiding it. There's, you know, uh, there's that band that sounds like they're ripping off the Bee Gees whole hog and stuff like that. And this doesn't feel like that, but it does have a certain... Uh, pull from maybe Elvis Costello and a few other ingredients. And what I love about the music that you always choose, it's not unlike Sam's beers in which you just can't have a straight line conversation about it. You can't go, ah, you know, it's like this. Mm -hmm. You have to add like 20 sentences to get something out of the storyline. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Yeah, I think I think it's, I mean, the kid's 19. He has all these influences from all these different things. He's taken from jazz, you know. I I hear like Van Morrison sometimes, and and his aesthetic and um, it's yeah. He takes a lot of different influences for such a young guy and puts it in his own unique kind of way. That's why I kind of appreciate about it. Can I, can I ask you guys a, a maybe maybe related maybe not un, 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 maybe not related question? But I noticed when when I buy albums, some of them are coming with downloads inside of them, and some of them aren't. And the same is true for the five that you gave us. I think two or three out of the five did have the download cards in them. What's your guys' take on that and the importance of that as a, a music lover, and, but b a music seller? And what does that mean for you guys? It's funny because even tonight I was um, helping this woman at the register and she's buying a record and she wanted to know if it came with the download code. She still bought it, but I, I think people enjoy you know, being able to get both and, and it definitely does kind of influence sales. So people are more likely to buy a record with the download code. Why would a label not let you why would a label not include the download so that they get you get you to buy two things or why? Yeah, I mean, I think that's why. There's a couple labels like Drag City that uh, that that still don't do it, and they, I think, they think they're giving you something for nothing. I mean, the record industry is really in a, a super complicated time right now, um, trying to figure out. I mean, not just that, but you know, the the whole streaming music thing, and you know how um, whether you know whether that's a, a fair way to pay artists paying. As you use music, not to not to own it. Um, I mean, I personally think that re all records should definitely come with downloads. Um, it's just that's how I listen to music now. Um, you know, I I love to buy vinyl. I love sitting at my record player at home and really like getting into a record like that. Um, it's I mean, it's fun to own them, but it's also just a different way of listening. You really have to make that decision to sit down and put it on. Do I want to hear the second side? You know, whatever. Whereas when you just start listening to something through your iPod or streaming, it just kind of plays on, and you come and sort of almost don't realize it. But I also um, have a lot of music on my phone. I, I listen. You know, sometimes I put on headphones when I'm walking my dog, or when I'm in the car, I always plug in my my phone and listen to. So you know, listen, rather than have CDs stuffed in there, you know, stuffed under the seat or something, I, I load up my phone with stuff, and that's the way I stay up on new music a lot of the time. Is you know plug my phone in or put on headphones on the train or something. So to me, it makes perfect sense. Um, really, like I said, in some ways, you know, music, I feel like that's almost like just a stopgap because now it's really streaming music that is the new way people are, are consuming it. It's not the MP3 downloads. It's, I think soon people are going to be moving beyond that even. Um, but some labels, I think they don't do it just for that reason, just because they think that, Eh, you know, they'll give it away or they're getting something for nothing. And, and you know, obviously labels are struggling, even the biggest ones, um, to find ways to to make money. You know, people, even for huge records like, uh, you know, you mentioned Arcade Fire and all that hype leading up to that record coming out, they, they put so much into that. And I'm, that record is huge, but I think it's it's not sold even what the last one did. You know, like the first week of that record is a lot less than the first week of their previous album, and a lot of that just has to do with the changing marketplace. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the the business of music. Uh, I, I read very avidly what Bob Lefsetz has to say about it, and one of the thoughts that I was having is that it, it's 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 put record stores in a really strange place because um, they're fetish items at this point. You know, the the vinyl. I've tried going for a run with a record player on my arm, and those, those little babes just fly off. It is no good. There's not enough Velcro to keep that thing on my arm. Um, and I think that, you know, you see things like Jay-Z's deal with what he did with his music and all that, and, and you really are almost always giving the media away for free at this point. And as much as we all grew up, loving, you know, record art and all that and loving having the actual media in our hand to, to like, smell and everything like that, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's going to be different places to collect that value now. There's different places where you have to collect the monetary value of it. So they're counting on, you know, the live experience. They're counting on the extras, uh, access and things like that. And, I mean, that may be one of those things 
you know, that you know, we've seen presaged a little bit with CD Baby and Beatport and some of these things, that it could be that the, the last holdout record stores end up becoming brokers of music into the system more so than the outlets of places coming out of the system. And I'm, I'm curious what anyone's take is on that concept, just because... You know, I don't know where the I don't know where you can uh, pick up the value in any other way as things start moving forward. You, you go to any modern bookstore right now, and it's about sixty percent toys and games. So that gives you a sense of where systems are moving. Well, do you guys have comments on that? I mean, it's it's interesting. I think I mean we're lucky enough to be obviously you know in Rim Manhattan, and it's like there's still a lot of really Music is still very important to a lot of people. Our our customers very important to them. It's not the casual record stores for the casual customers. Those are gone. You know, um, really, what's left is the ones who really diehard music junkies and fans. And there's still a lot of our customers. You know, still the the physical thing is still so important to them. Like they collect it. They you know they just they breathe it in. They you know it's it's part of their, their being. Um, I think that will always be a place in some way, you know, a small one. And whether it's obviously whether there's enough of those people around to do places like us, you know, survive and stuff too, you know, that that's to be seen. But, but I think yeah, I think I mean I think Chris is right. There's I mean we've always tried to be a place where you can discover music and whether it be we obviously to sell physical goods, downloads, um, you know, just even just people who don't even buy stuff but just read our commentary, um, almost like a almost like a broker of like telling people what what we're like a there's so much stuff out there mm -hmm. to weed through it all is very tough and we we try to be the place where you can perhaps go to to weed through that and we're kind of like the, this conduit to good music you know. Mm -hmm. well, we're oh, yeah. the curator gets much, yeah. but it's true. Why that is, is another question. Correct. And also, just I mean, I, I also feel like you know the kind of music that we have championed for a long time, the kind of records we're talking about today, you can't deny that those have become, you know, more a part of popular culture or mainstream culture because of uh, moving to digital culture. You know, because of streaming, because of those things being so accessible, people can just take a chance. They hear about William on your bar. They don't have to spend. You know, go to the store, spend fifteen dollars, whatever, to decide if they like it. They can go listen. They can just go check it out. Um, I mean, I, I, we also have a label, and I noticed recently we have this artist called Mutual Benefit who's really blowing up right now and getting a ton of press. And I looked at what his um, Spotify streams are like, and every day he, for the past you know few weeks, he's been doing getting ten to twenty thousand streams a day on Spotify, and that's just one service and just in the U.S. Um, but this is an artist who, a couple months ago, was really totally unknown, and that's, you know, 10 to 20,000 people hearing his songs, you know, every single day. And it's really changed what he can do. He's booking tours. We have tours for him all over the world booked right now. He's, you know, I'm watching him sell tickets in San Francisco and L.A. and Chicago and London, and, you know, you can see how quickly... He's able to actually connect directly with fans who are who are really being moved by his music, and it's hard for me to say because we sell records here, and, and you know I'm trying to sell his records too, and I haven't gotten a check from Spotify yet, but I, my guess is it's going to be pretty sad in a lot of ways. But that said, it's doing amazing things for an artist like him, and it, it you know there's a lot of this kind of music we're talking about today can thrive because of the new technology. Well, and that's a you know your your opportunity there, of course, is that you if you have both sides of that pie, you know you've got the media sale, but you've also got a bite out of the the event bookings or whatever. Then you have a reason that's and a. I, how can I get that deal? <laughs> you no, know, uh, we could talk about that. Hey, you know, in the in the small amount of time we have left, we have about thirteen or so minutes left of this live event. We've got two more albums to talk about, and uh, you guys want to do Steve Gunn first, or I'll never pronounce it right ever, Sayed Bonaire? You said it better than me. It's not, I would have that with a little bit of rice, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Which one do you guys want to cover first? Why don't we
We can talk about the sauna from there. Let's get the sauna from there out of the way. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not the expert on their backstory, but we play that record in the store almost every day. It's one of those records that every time it comes on, it sounds so good, and it puts everybody who's shopping in a good mood, yeah. and like almost everyone walks out yeah. with the record, which I think is why we thought it would be nice to include it. And it also just came out about a month ago, so it's pretty new, but it still like moved its way up the charts of the store really quickly for being really so late in the year. And I love the combination of, you know, sense with a kind of dub atmosphere and the whole kind of 80s sort of post-punk with this, you know, reggae influence. I love that kind of stuff. So I think that was a lot of people responded to that fusion of sounds as well. And the girls sound, they sound great. They sound super cute, you know, and just bubbly, um, having a good time, you know, really catchy lyrics, really kind of silly at times. But I think that all works in its favor. It makes it a, a really enjoyable record and a refreshing record right now. I mean, and the backstory a little bit is just that you know they, they put out one seven inch at a time. It really right. it really wasn't a group that reached any wide audiences back in the day. They they put out one seven inch three songs. Um, this is you know expands on what they did then and kind of reaches into the archives. Um, and it was you know they were bringing together a bunch of different cultures at the time also. You know, it was, um, you know, produced by Dennis Lovell, kind of a, you know, a, coming from the reggae world, um, but it really wasn't part of that, you know, sort of bringing together dub and sort of 80s electro sounds and pop and Middle Eastern sounds um, to, to do something new with it. The fact that this is a reissue is interesting just insofar as the fact that it, it, this album really couldn't have existed uh, five years ago, four years ago even. It, you know, it's it needed like the ting tings and some of these other kinds of things to get back onto the shelf again, I think. Totally. I, I liked, uh, it, for me, I lo it was the most beautiful packaging, I think, of the five. And... Um, for me, beer-wise, part of my choice was I wanted to open a big beer because I knew I was gonna sit in front of both sides, you know, four sides of of the album, and wanted to read everything, <laughs> everything that it came with. So I needed 750 milliliters of beer to do that, and uh, so I, I really liked uh, having this with the um, the beer we did with the Grateful Dead, the American Beauty. Even though the the the, the music sounds so different uh, than the Grateful Dead. Um, I thought they worked really well together. You know, in a way, I think you could get the sense that uh, the Grateful Dead wouldn't mind having these guys on a side stage or something like that. I, I just might be wishful thinking. What did the other team say about that? Team other? Do, do we think that the Grateful Dead would like that, you're saying? <laughs> I, I well, said that maybe a nice side stage kind of a project. Yeah, I so I I'm sure. into it. Which beer did you guys feel would go well with the band? You went with the Pilsner. You went, went to the Piercing Pilsner. Hey, Chris, you nice. Nicely. You were saying, you know, yeah. flip over to Chris. Yeah, I, I think the Pilsner, you know, is, is good for like. I can see that you know in a Europe, yeah, a club somewhere dancing, you know, you know just like the little, it's a little lighter. It's um, it's good for like an evening of you know going out dancing and. You know, Last a little longer, you know, not as not as heavy. It's me to say the more club like dancing, you know, clubbing kind of thing. And it sounds very European that record. It reminds me just it's like it's obviously the hosh of a different influence. It's reminds me very European, you know, eighties, you know, Euro style. Um, so I, I personally would pair it with the children myself, just uh, for an evening out of you know something nothing nothing to, to knock me out too early, you know. Sam, I might have to go with the, uh, you know, Chris and everybody over there because, I mean, American Beauty to me is kind of like bourbon pretending to be beer. So I think there's a certain, uh, I think there's a certain brilliance to the idea that, you know, if we we're going to dance all night, you know, prior to the ecstasy or something, that's the Pilsner that has to come out first. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, then that leaves this last this last one, which is what I had paired. You know, I paired the American Beauty with the Steve Gunn album. Uh, that was that was ours too, actually. We we agreed. <laughs> and. Uh,